You've heard the formula. Fold equity equals chance they fold times size of the pot. Sounds simple, right? In our previous video, we broke that down how fold equity works, how it's calculated, and why it's one of the most powerful tools in poker. But here's the part nobody talks about. What happens when it fails? When your opponent doesn't fold. When your bluff runs into resistance. When a good-looking spot turns into a train wreck. This video is the companion to that first one, but this time we're telling the other side of the story. We'll break down real-world scenarios where fold equity backfires. We'll walk through the numbers, the assumptions, and the danger of overestimating your influence at the table. Because fold equity isn't just about math. It's about pressure, perception, and sometimes misplaced confidence. Let's get into it. Before we talk about what happens when fold equity goes wrong, let's make sure we're clear on what it is. Fold equity is the expected value you gain from the chance that your opponent will fold when you bet. It's not about your hand's strength, it's about your opponent's reaction to pressure. The basic formula is simple. Fold equity equals probability opponent folds times size of the pot. So, if the pot is $100 and you believe your opponent will fold 40% of the time, your fold equity is $40, that's your added expected value just from the chance they give up. Used correctly, it can turn weak hands into strong plays. But that's only if your read is right and your story is believable. And that brings us to the real reason we're here. So, what happens when fold equity doesn't show up? Let's break it down with a realistic scenario. You're in a hand where the pot is $100. You're holding a weak hand, maybe a pure bluff, and you decide to bet $80, thinking your opponent will fold 35% of the time. On paper, your fold equity is $35. You're expecting to win that $100 pot more than a third of the time. That's what justifies the bluff. But he doesn't fold. He calls. Now the pot is $260. You have no showdown value. You are running a stone-cold bluff. So you do what a lot of players do. You fire again, this time $200. He calls again. You check the river. He shows a pair. You lose. Let's do the math. Total wrist. $80 plus $200 equals $280. Total reward if the first bluff worked, $100. So to break even on this bluff line, you'd need it to work roughly 36% of the time across the full play, not just the flop. But your original fold equity calculation, that 35%, only covered the flop bet. It didn't justify a second barrel. And now, you've committed nearly three times what you hope to win. This is what happens when players misapply fold equity across multiple streets without thinking ahead. They start with a good plan, but keep pushing after the plan failed. And in doing so, they turn a controlled bluff into a high-cost, low-equity gamble. Or let's take another outcome. Same hand. Same flop bet. $80 into $100. But instead of calling, your opponent raises. Now what? You're bluffing. You can't call. You can't re-raise. Your fold equity just got check-raised out of existence. And you've lit $80 on fire because you never planned for resistance. If you're basing your bluff on a single street's math, but committing chips across multiple streets without enough fold potential to back it up, you're not betting with precision. You are bluffing with hope. Here's the part the spreadsheets don't cover. Fold equity is psychological. It's not just a formula. It's a bet on what your opponent believes. Do they think you're strong? Do they think you believe you're strong? Do they respect your line, your timing, your image? If the answer to any of those is no, your fold equity just dropped through the floor, whether you know it or not. If you've been caught bluffing recently, if you're perceived as wild or tilted, if you're short-stacked or desperate, players are less likely to fold to you. Fold equity dies when your story doesn't match your image. And sometimes, that image is out of your control. It's based on hands your opponent wasn't even involved in. They just saw the showdown, logged the data, and made their decision. You might be thinking, they're supposed to fold here. But they're thinking, I don't believe you. You also need to ask, who am I trying to get to fold? Tight players? You might have real fold equity. Loose passive players? Less so, they call too much. Poker bullies or egotistical players? They might call just to prove you wrong. Sometimes, you're not just betting against a range. You're betting against a personality. 
And when your opponent's identity is tied to aggression, pride, or image, you're not getting that fold no matter what your HUD or math chart says. And sometimes the reverse happens. You bet small, trying to look strong. They see weakness and raise, not because they read your range, but because their ego interpreted your sizing as an insult. That's why fold equity isn't just about the cards. It's about context, perception, psychology, and sometimes projection. If you're not factoring in the mindset of the player across from you, you're not calculating fold equity, you're guessing. Let's pause the theory and ask the real question. Why are you bluffing? To win the pot? Of course, but let's go deeper. Ask yourself this. How much of your total winnings come from bluffing and how much of your total losses? Now take a look at your biggest losing hands over the last month. How many of those were bluffs or semi-bluffs that never got there? And when you do bluff, are you targeting the right players? Are you picking the right pots? Or are you just betting because it feels like the right time? One of the best quotes in poker comes from a pro who said, most of your winnings aren't the result of your brilliant play. They're the result of your opponent's mistakes. Let that sink in. You don't beat the game by outplaying everyone. You beat the game by letting them outplay themselves. And most players lose money trying to be clever. They bluff too often, in the wrong spots, against the wrong people, and then justify it with math that only works on paper. If you're bluffing, small pots that don't matter, big pots where no one folds, against people who love to call, or in spots where you're visible, body language, bet sizing, hesitation, then you're not using fold equity as a weapon. You're using it as a crutch. And here's the part no one says out loud. If your opponents don't fold, your fold equity is worthless, no matter what the numbers say. This isn't a call to stop bluffing. It's a call to audit your bluffing and cut the garbage. Bluff with a reason. Bluff with a plan. Bluff where it actually moves the needle, not just your adrenaline. Because when bluffing becomes habit instead of strategy, that's not poker anymore. That's performance art and bad art at that. Number one, know your opponent. Fold equity lives or dies based on who you're targeting. Against type players who fear big pots, bluffing can work. Against calling stations, don't waste your chips. Against egotistical players, let them hang themselves. But here's a word of warning. Tight doesn't mean weak. Bluffing type players only works before they've shown interest in the hand. If they've called your flop bet, that's not just seeing one. That's a player with real equity, someone who understands odds, board texture, and hand strength. You're not just trying to bluff a player. You're trying to bluff someone who may already be pot committed by principle. So, before you run that barrel, look at their pre-flop discipline. Consider board texture and ask yourself, Am I trying to bluff someone who only plays strong hands and plays them well? Because bluffing into a tight player with a made hand isn't strategy. It's wishful thinking. Number two, respect stack to pot ratio. You can't bluff someone who's already committed. If they've already invested 75% of their stack, they're not folding to your pressure, even if it makes no sense. Short stack to pot ratio equals short bluffing window. Instead, look for deeper stacks where you can apply pressure over multiple streets. That's where fold equity thrives, not in desperation spots. Number three, don't bet into hope. Bluffing should never feel like, I hope this works. It should feel like, I've told a consistent story. I've represented real strength. I've targeted the right opponent at the right time. And this line has fold equity to back it up. If your bluff isn't grounded in all of that, check the brakes. Because once you fire that barrel, you can't pull it back. Number four, hide in plain sight. If you are going to bluff, make sure nothing about you changes. Same motion, same rhythm, same confidence. Because if your bet is believable, but your body isn't, you've already been called. Fold equity doesn't work when you're screaming insecurity at the table. You're not just betting, you're performing. And the best performances are the ones no one notices. Bluffing is not about showing how smart you are. It's about taking calculated risks that earn consistent profit over time. That's how real players use fold equity. As a scalpel, not a sledgehammer. Fold equity isn't a gimmick. It's a tool. But like any tool, you have to know when to use it. And when to leave it in the box. The math matters. The psychology matters. But the misuse of fold equity? That's what costs players the most. The best bluffers aren't reckless. They're deliberate. 
they know their opponents, they know the board, and they know themselves. If you got value from this video, do me a favor. Like, subscribe, drop a comment below. I read them all. This is Terry Wood from PokerRailbird.com, and stay tuned for the next video in the series. Why Bluff? A no-fluff breakdown of what bluffing really is, what it isn't, and how to know if you should even be doing it in the first place. Because the truth is, bluffing can be brilliant, or it can be ego in disguise. You'll find out which in the next one. Until then, we'll see you at the tables.